Okay. Uh, thanks to uh, Greg and Naomi for giving me the opportunity to sort of introduce maybe some of you to what we're doing with the COAMP system, the new uh, prediction capability for the Navy that we're calling COAMP's TC. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> acknowledge my co-authors listed here, and also Pete Black and Russ Ellsbury, who we work closely with, along with some folks at NRL Stennis um, working with us on the ERC coupling, and uh, sponsors listed below as well. So the outline for this talk, I'd like to provide a little background on the system, discuss some of the things we've done with the real-time test in the last couple years, um, and then move on to some diagnostics, recent improvements to the system, discuss some new capabilities, and then uh, end with a summary. So the COAMP system has been the operational mesoscale modeling system for the Navy since uh, in the last 10 years or so to support research and operations. And it's really only within the last couple years we've had a, a real concerted effort to put together a tropical cyclone forecast system. And this includes new components to the analysis and physics as well. Our goal is, of course, to predict track structure and intensity, but the Navy's interested also in the ocean response as well. So this includes the ocean wave and circulation response too. So we demonstrated in real time in the last couple of years, 2008 and nine seasons. And this was motivated in part by uh, the T Park experiment and also the HFIP projects using uh, the configuration as that I'll be discussing today is 45, 15, and 5 with the inner two mo most meshes moving and following the storms. So our near-term objectives for the project are to evaluate the skill for some of these real-time forecasts, um, do research uh, in between the seasons to improve the prediction of the track intensity and structure. We'd like to transition this to operations to the Navy and also participate in the HFIP multi-model ensemble, which we think is very important. And then uh, along the way, hopefully provide some new insight into TC couple uh, processes, which we're really keen to understand along with uh, dynamics and predictability. So this is an overview of the, uh, of the system. And uh, basically, it has a 3D VAR analysis capability that's I'll talk more about in a minute. The atmospheric model is non-hydrostatic. The special uh, aspects of the TC, we have the TC system include moving nests, dissipative heating. We have a spray parameterization that we have in now um, from Chris Farrow and also a shallow convection scheme. The ocean analysis includes 2D and 3D um, OI options. The ocean models, we have uh, the ENCOM circulation model along with the wave models. Right now, the SWAN model is included, and we're building in the WaveWatch 3 model um, with our colleagues at Stennis. We're using uh, the ESMF uh, framework to do the coupling with the ocean model. We're also building in ensemble capabilities, and we're, now we have an ensemble transform capability, and all, along with some physics perturbations. We have actually done some preliminary coupled ensemble forecasts, which I'll show you an example of. And so th that's sort of the direction we're heading. <laughs> The way we initialize the uh, tropical cyclone involves using a series of synthetic observations based in part on a modified Rankin vortex along with information from the warning message and uh, truncated fields from our global model no gaps. These are blended with the other observations within the 3D VAR framework NAVDAS. And as part of this, we do a relocation of the first guess as part of the, of the, uh, the warm start uh, the model cycles on itself, and the uh, synthetics then act to improve the representation of the uh, inner vortex. This shows the distribution of the synthetics for Typhoon Sinlaku in the Western Pacific in 2008. So we went in um, relatively accelerated development program, began really in earnest in the early part of 2008 and fielded a real-time system in time for the experiment in late summer. And uh, we did have some successes, first of all, discussed track. So we had some successes that we felt looked quite good. Best track here in black. The colors are the various forecasts from different watch times. But we also had some real challenges. A lot of models had challenges with Sinlaku, with a lot of recurvature happening early on. The track uh, forecast for 
um, verification for not only COEMS TC, but the other models, including the global models, no gaps, um, are shown in this graph. And COEMS, I think we're pretty happy in terms of track. It, it was very similar to the uh, global model that was driving at no gaps in terms of statistics. All of the models by 72 hours were trailing significantly ECMWF's model, which had a very good year in the Western Pacific this particular year. Japanese was quite good too. COEMS had outperformed the GFDN model, that version of the GFDN model run in the Pacific um, at that time. We did some uh, structure verification. This was within, with collaboration with the folks at NPS. This is from a student's thesis, Jenny Hensley. Um, Pat Har and Russ Ellsbury were working with us on that. And this shows um, one of the later stages of Typhoon Nuri, which was approaching the Philippines. Satellite imagery, microwave satellite imagery on the right. This is the COAMS forecast on the left, simulated radar reflectivity. The forecast captured the distribution of the convection quite well, although there are aspects that were not that good, including over forecasting the precipitation on the western side of the storm. But I just want to show this because the actual forecast position was actually several degrees off by 72 hours. So um, I think the, uh, the regional forecast people can't lose sight of the importance of the track forecast as well, obviously. I know it's an obvious point, but sometimes we get quite um, wrapped up on the intensity aspects of the forecast problem. Speaking of intensity, we had um, a fairly successful forecast predicting rapid intensification of super typhoon Chang Changmi um, in September and uh, <clears throat> 2008. And this shows the model simulated radar reflectivity of the innermost mesh, the five kilometer mesh, as it approached Taiwan. Um, but we did see some problems with this particular simulation, especially early in the forecast where the convection was very spotty um, and disorganized. And this was a very common feature, especially for weaker storms. And I think overall, we found that the intensity forecasts were not as skillful as the t statistical model. So in spite of the occasional success in terms of intensity, we had, um, I think, a number of setbacks. So we went to the, back to the drawing board after our 2008 season and um, worked on a new version of COAMS TC. And we did a lot of modifications to the analysis, including the synthetics in the 3D VAR, and improved a number of aspects of the physics, modifying the boundary layer, um, actually making some improvements to the ice nucleation, new sea spray parameterization, Chris Farrell's sea spray was included. It wasn't included in the 2008 version. We also included a shallow convection parameterization to help pump some of the moisture out of the boundary layer, which was a big problem. So we found that this new version of the COEMS TC improved the uh, initial and forecast intensity and the overall structure. We did some work collaborating with HRD and Rob Rogers, comparing our version from 2008 with the new version um, with the Doppler observations from Katrina. This is as Muthley averaged tangential winds shaded and the radial winds and contours. And um, we found this to be very useful to look at some of the details of the structure. And just to uh, emphasize a point that Naomi and Chris talked about, is that coming out of this, we learned, I think, that we need much more systematic structure diagnosis um, to be able to understand what our changes to the modeling system is doing more than just the number. Um, so statistics coming into uh, uh, going back and, re and reforecasting for the 2008 season, we, we found some very nice improvements in terms of the intensity. The new version of the model in red for the intensity error, the old version in blue, we had large intensity error at the initial time. We were able to bring that down quite a bit, and that held uh, throughout the forecast for some nice improvement. The model in terms of intensity error compared fairly favorably with the GFDN model out through at least 48 hours. By 72, it slipped a little bit. We went, not showing it here, but re-ran the Atlantic for the entire 2008 season and saw very similar um, improvements as well. So. We entered the 2009 season feeling um, quite, quite confident, I would say. And I think Mother, Mother Nature taught us an, another lesson, not that we needed another lesson to be taught to us, but we, we uh, found that um, almost all aspects of our forecast that we thought were working well didn't work that well in the Atlantic in 2009. But this is just an example of the homogeneous track error comparing 
um, coamps in blue with no gaps in the red in the uh, GFS and GFDL models. And we trailed substantially in terms of the track error um, early in the forecast. And what we're suspecting now is that this has to do with some inadequacies of our TC vortex initialization, which appears to be more appropriate, these synthetic observations for stronger um, parts or life cycles of the vortex rather than these weak storms. And so the Atlantic had lots of weak storms and we saw um, lots of problems with the track. And, um, and there's some speculation, we saw a rightward bias in the track as well, and some speculations that we're impacting the outer winds too much, our storms may be too large, and we're seeing a rightward turn to the storms. Also, we saw an over-intensification bias. This is uh, the bias versus time. We have a little bit of a low bias initially, and then a fairly substantial bias later in the forecast. Although in the Westpac, our statistics were a little bit better because the storms were... I think a little more well-developed last season than in the Atlantic. So we went back and uh, looked in the, in the process of looking at some retrospective forecasts. And this is a series of forecasts for Hurricane Bill. And this is actually with the fully coupled system. So the forecasts that I talked about for the previous two seasons were actually done uncoupled. And this is a test. Um, it was done uncoupled because we're still in development of the fully coupled system. This is the animation of the COAMS TC predicted sea surface temperature and currents that were done from this coupled system. And if we overplot the SST change over a 72 hour period, it compares fairly favorably with a two to three degree C cooling that happens below the storm and is left in the wake of, of uh, Hurricane Bill. If we go back and um, look at the intensity errors now for the uncoupled and coupled system, we can see a substantial improvement in terms of the uh, intensity error with the coupled system, something that we knew um, from uh, experiments from the GFDL group and others as well in, in the past. So we are forging ahead with the development of our coupled system. We also are developing an adjoint system that allows a really elegant way of computing forecast sensitivity. The system is a bit unique in that includes full suite of microphysics and also grid nesting. This is an example from uh, Typhoon Nuri, which we had some LIDAR observations during Tea Park that showed sort of an asymmetric structure to the system, which was captured by the nonlinear model. So this is run at fairly coarse resolution, 13 kilometers, but it's pretty fine resolution for these adjoint type of applications. And what we found was that the sensitivity, and this is the sensitivity with respect to the water vapor, really underscores the importance of the moisture variable for genesis. And I think this was mentioned earlier. It's absolutely of critical importance. We also saw, saw some interesting structures related to the vorticity sensitivity as well. And I think the overall message that Kerry talked about today, I think is there's a real need to quantify predictability of the TC life cycle and its characteristics. We have to know um, at what point do we reach diminishing returns as far as um, forecast lengths and also resolution. I think that's a critical question. Along those lines, we're developing an ensemble capability within the model. And this is an example of Hurricane Ike. And this is actually a, a coupled ensemble, that 29 members. It's relatively coarse resolution, 81 and 27 kilometers, but we can run finer resolution when we grab some more computer time. And this just shows the various tracks from different um, initialization times and all the initialization times just as a demonstration of the system. We're starting to look at um, the ocean response as well within this ensemble. So let me summarize. So the um, high resolution TC predictions in 2008 and 9 um, highlighted a few areas of challenges for our model and probably for others models as well. One is the vortex initialization, especially for these weak and sheared storms that both Chris and Naomi talked about. I think um, for us, there's a real problem with organized convection in the microphysics in regions of weak forcing, and also air-sea interaction in the high wind regime. I think there's still uncertainties with that. I think we need to uh, move towards a fully coupled system to better represent that. Um, we saw some promising results, in fact, from the air-ocean coupling related to the intens over-intensification issue. And uh, we're working, forward, or working hard on making uh, some further improvements to the system based on the real-time forecast. Our future research 
We're uh, developing ensemble common filter and 4D VAR capabilities within the system to better address this vortex initialization issue. Um, improvements to the microphysics, we'd like to work with the community on this issue, as well as the coupling issue. We're involved with a NOP project that's um, focused on the ARC coupling. Um, I mentioned earlier the predictability issue. Um, community co collaborations we're pursuing through HFIP, NOP, various field projects, and um, mentioning, I think Louis mentioned it earlier, I think this model diversity issue is important, and I think one way forward is the multi-model high-resolution ensembles that we're attempting under HFIP. I think that's an important issue, and also community-based diagnostics that um, Naomi mentioned. I think that's an important issue as well. We need to pool our resources and be able to not only compare to observations, but observations or also other models as well. So we need efficient tools to be able to do that. So I'll stop there and happy to answer questions.